uma produção WGBH Boston associada à Harvard University. Qual a coisa certa a fazer? Justice, com Michael Sandel. We have two remaining questions to answer. First, is it necessary, is it unavoidable, to take up questions of the good life in thinking about justice? Yes. And is it possible to reason about justice? Yes, I think so. Let me try to develop those answers to those two questions. Now, as a way of addressing those questions, we began last time to discuss the question of same-sex marriage. And we heard from those who argued against same-sex marriage on the grounds that the purpose or telos of marriage is at least in part procreation the bearing and raising of children. And then there were those who defended same-sex marriage, and they contested that account of the purpose or telos of marriage, arguing, we don't require, as a condition of heterosexual marriage, that couples be able or willing to procreate. We allow infertile couples to marry. This is Hannah's point in the exchange with Mark. But then there was another position expressed at the end of our discussion by Victoria, who argued, we shouldn't try to decide this question. We shouldn't, at least at the level of the state, at the level of law, try to come to any agreement on those questions about the good, because we live in a pluralist society where people have different moral and religious convictions. And so we should try to make law and the framework of rights neutral with respect to these competing moral and religious views. Now, it's interesting that others, some others, who favor the idea of neutrality, argued not in favor of restricting marriage to a man and a woman, nor in favor of permitting same-sex marriage. They argued, in the name of neutrality, for a third possibility, which is that government get out of the business of recognizing any kind of marriage. That was the third possibility. Now, Andrea Mayrose had an interesting contribution to this debate. She had a rejoinder to people who argue for neutrality. Where is Andrea? All right. Andrea, would you be willing to share with us the view, if we can get you a microphone, share, share with us your view. Why do you think? that it's a mistake for the state to try to be neutral on moral and even religious questions like same-sex marriage. I don't know that it is possible because people's lives are completely embedded in how they, how they view the world. And um, maybe I just agree with Aristotle that the role of the government is helping people live in a sort of, like having a collective understanding of what what is wrong and what is right. Is it possible, and one could ask the same question of abortion that we've been asking of same-sex marriage, do you think it's possible to decide whether abortion should be permitted or prohibited without taking a stand or making a judgment about the moral permissibility of abortion? No, I don't think it is, and I think that's why it's such a controversy, because people are so deeply committed to like, their fundamental beliefs about whether a fetus is a life or if it isn't. So it's, if I believe that a, like, a fetus is a living being and has rights 
and, and has like fundamentally the, the right to live, then it's very hard for me to say, but I can put that aside and let you do what you want. Because that's like me saying, well, despite my beliefs, I'm going to let you commit what to me is murder. So, and I mean, that's just, that's All just right, one. And the, anal the analogy in the same-sex marriage case is, you said you're a defender of same-sex marriage. Yes. But you only came to that view once you were persuaded on the underlying moral question. Right. Well, I think particularly in the U.S., so many people's um, beliefs are driven by their religious beliefs. And um, like Mark the other day, I'm Christian, I'm Catholic, and I had to decide for myself, like on a lot of thought, a lot of prayer, a lot of conversations with other people, that I disagreed with the Catholic standpoint that homosexuality itself isn't a sin. And once I came to that sort of conclusion in my personal relationship with God, like, I mean, that sounds hokey, right? That's like, oh, religious. But a lot of people are religious, and that's where they draw their beliefs and their views from. Um, that's when I could say, yeah, I'm, I'm down with the state saying, go same-sex marriage, because I'm okay with that. And right. I, I think that's morally okay. Good. Thank you. Now, who would like to, ad who would like to reply, if you can perhaps hang on there for a moment, who would like to reply to Andrea's idea that in order to decide the question of same-sex marriage, it's necessary to sort out the question about the moral status of homosexuality and figuring out the purpose, the telos, the proper end of marriage. Who disagrees with Andrea on that point? Yes. Well, uh, I think you absolutely can separate your moral opinion and uh, what you think the law should be. For example, I think abortion is unequivocally morally wrong, but I do not believe that illegalizing abortion makes it go away. I don't believe illegalizing abortion stops it, and therefore I am pro-choice, and I do believe the woman should have the choice as it gives them more safety, just as maybe morally I don't want to get married to a man, but I'm not going to try to, um, you know, um, impede someone else's freedom to do what they wish to do in terms of uh, the law. Andrea? Whether the law makes something legal or illegal, is it's implicitly um, approving or disapproving something. So if you say, like, by making abortion legal, we're saying it's okay. As a society, collectively, we're saying it's okay with us in our society to abort a fetus. If we make it legal, um, if we make it illegal, then we're saying collectively at a si as a society, it's not okay. And that's why societies and have tell, beliefs. Tell us your name before My you name is Daniel. Daniel, what do you say? Are, are we saying collectively that it's okay? Are we saying that collectively we don't want women who are going to have an abortion anyway to go to clinics in the side alleys and have, you know, un unsafe conditions? All right, bring it to the same-sex marriage case. Why don't you have to decide that which position you're in favor of same-sex marriage, Daniel, uh, being legally I'm, permitted? I think it absolutely should be legally permitted because it's not something telling me that I need to, have, I need to marry a man. I, I absolutely don't, I don't see if two men are consenting adults and want to get married, I don't see how I could even object to that. All right. There's no harm. There's, There's no, no harm, harm done either way, even if, it, if, if, even if it is morally wrong according to me. All right. Let, let, me, um, let me turn to the way the Massachusetts court, who made this landmark ruling in the same-sex marriage case, grappled with the very issue that Andrea and Dan have been uh, discussing here. Thanks to both of you very much. What did the court say? This was in the Goodridge case, which required the state of Massachusetts to extend marriage to same-sex couples. The court started out, well, the court was conflicted. If you read that opinion carefully, the court was conflicted as between the two positions we've just been hearing, defended by Andrea and by Dan. The court begins, and this is Chief Justice Margaret Marshall's opinion, it begins with an attempt at liberal neutrality. Many people hold deep-seated religious, moral, and ethical convictions that marriage should be limited to the union of one man and one woman, and that homosexual conduct is immoral. Many hold equally strong religious, moral, and ethical convictions that same-sex couples are entitled to be married, that homosexual persons should be treated no differently than their heterosexual neighbors. This is the court. Neither view answers the question 
before us. What is at stake is, quote, respect for individual autonomy and equality under law. At stake is an individual freely choosing the person with whom to share an exclusive commitment. In other words, at issue is not the moral worth of the choice, but the right of the individual to make it. So this is the liberal neutral strand in the court opinion, voluntary strand, the one that emphasizes autonomy, choice, consent. But the court seemed to realize that the liberal case, the neutral case, for recognizing same-sex marriage doesn't succeed, doesn't get you all the way to that position. Because if it were only a matter of respect for individual autonomy, if government were truly neutral on the moral worth of voluntary intimate relationships, then it should adopt a different policy which is to remove government and the state altogether from according recognition to certain associations, certain kinds of unions, rather than others. If government really must be neutral, then the consistent position is what we here have been describing as the third position, the one defended in the article by Michael Kinsley, who argues for the abolition of marriage, at least as a state function. Perhaps a better term for this is the disestablishment of religion. This is Kinsley's proposal. He points out that the reason for the opposition to same-sex marriage is that it would go beyond neutral toleration and give same-sex marriage a government stamp of approval. That's at the heart of the dispute. In Aristotle's terms, at issue here is the proper distribution of offices and honors, a matter of social recognition. Same-sex marriage can't be justified on the basis of liberal neutrality or non-discrimination or autonomy rights alone, because the question at stake in the public debate is whether same-sex unions have moral worth, whether they're worthy of honor and recognition, and whether they fit the purpose of the social institution of marriage. So, Kinsley says, you want to be neutral? Then let churches and other religious institutions offer marriage ceremonies. Let department stores and casinos get into the act if they want to. This is Kinsley. Let couples celebrate their union in any way they choose and consider themselves married whenever they want. And if three people want to get married, or if one person wants to marry himself or herself, <laughs> and someone else wants to conduct a ceremony for them and declare them married, let them. If you and your government are implicated, what do you care? This is Kinsley. But this is not the position that the Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts wanted. They didn't call for the abolition or for the disestablishment of marriage. The court did not question government's role in conferring social recognition on some intimate associations rather than others. To the contrary, the court waxes eloquent about marriage as, quote, one of our community's most rewarding and cherished institutions. And then it goes on to expand the definition of marriage to include partners of the same sex. And in doing so, it acknowledges that marriage is more than a matter of tolerating choices that individuals make. It's also a matter of social recognition and honor. As Justice Marshall wrote, in a real sense, there are three partners to every civil marriage, two willing spouses, and an approving state. Marriage is at once a deeply personal commitment, but also a highly public celebration of the ideals of mutuality, companionship, intimacy, fidelity, and family. This is the court. Now, this is reaching well beyond liberal neutrality. This is celebrating and affirming marriage as an honorific, as a form of public recognition. And therefore, the court found that it couldn't avoid the debate about the telos of marriage. 
Justice Marshall's opinion considers and rejects the notion that the primary purpose of marriage is procreation. She points out that there's no requirement that applicants for a marriage license who are heterosexuals attest to their ability or their intention to conceive children. Fertility is not a condition of marriage. People who cannot stir from their deathbed may marry. So she advances all kinds of arguments along the lines that we began last time about what the proper and the essential nature, the telos of marriage is. And she concludes, not procreation, but the exclusive and permanent commitment of the partners to one another is the essential point and purpose of marriage. Now, nothing I've said about this court opinion is an argument for or against same-sex marriage, but it is an argument against the claim that you can favor or oppose same-sex marriage while remaining neutral on the underlying moral and religious questions. So all of this is to suggest that at least in some of the hotly contested debates about justice and rights that we have in our society, the attempt to be neutral, the attempt to say it's just a matter of consent and choice and autonomy, we take no stand, that doesn't succeed. Even the court, which wants to be neutral on these moral and religious disputes, finds that it can't. What then about our second question? If reasoning about the good is unavoidable in debates about justice and rights, is it possible? If reasoning about the good means that you must have a single principle or rule or maxim or criterion for the good life that you simply plug in every time you have a disagreement about morality, then the answer is no. But having a single principle or rule is not the only way, not the best way, of reasoning either about the good life or about justice. Think back, think back to the arguments that we've been having here about justice and about rights and sometimes about the good life. How have those arguments proceeded? They've proceeded very much in the way that Aristotle suggests, moving back and forth between our judgments about particulars, particular cases, events, stories, questions, back and forth between our judgments about particular cases and more general principles that make sense of our reasons for the positions we take on the particular cases. This dialectical way of doing moral reasoning goes back to the ancients, to Plato and Aristotle, but it doesn't stop with them because there is a version of Socratic or dialectical moral reasoning that is defended with great clarity and force by John Rawls in giving an account of his method of justifying a theory of justice. You remember, it's not only the veil of ignorance and the principles that Rawls argues for. It's also a method of moral reasoning, reasoning about justice, that he calls reflective equilibrium. What is the method of reflective equilibrium? It's moving back and forth between our considered judgments about particular cases and the general principles we would articulate to make sense of those judgments. And not just stopping there, because we might be wrong in our initial intuitions. Not stopping there, but then sometimes revising our particular judgments in the light of the principles once we work them out. So sometimes we revise the principles, sometimes we revise our judgments and intuitions in the particular cases. The general point is this, and here I quote Rawls, a conception of justice can't be deduced from self-evident premises. 
Its justification is a matter of the mutual support of many considerations, of everything fitting together into one coherent view. And later in A Theory of Justice he writes, moral philosophy is Socratic. We may want to change our present considered judgments once their regulative principles are brought to light. Well, if Rawls accepts that idea and advances that notion of reflective equilibrium, the question we're left with is, he applies that to questions of justice, not to questions of morality and the good life. But, and that's why he remains committed to the priority of the right over the good. He thinks the method of reflective equilibrium can generate shared judgments about justice and the right, but he doesn't think they can generate shared judgments about the good life, about what he calls comprehensive moral and religious questions. And the reason he thinks that is that he says that in modern societies, there is a fact of reasonable pluralism about the good. Even conscientious people who reason well will find that they disagree about questions of the good life, about morality and religion. And Rawls is likely right about that. He's not talking about the fact of disagreement in pluralist societies. He's also suggesting that there may be persisting disagreements about the good life and about moral and religious questions. But if that's true, then is he warranted in his further claim that the same can't be said about justice? Isn't it also true, not only that we as a matter of fact disagree about justice in pluralist societies, but that at least some of those disagreements are reasonable disagreements in the same way. Some people favor a libertarian theory of justice, others a more egalitarian theory of justice, and they argue. And there is pluralism in our society as between free market, laissez-faire, libertarian theories of justice and more egalitarian ones. Is there any difference in principle between the kind of moral reasoning and the kind of disagreements that arise when we debate about justice and the meaning of free speech and the nature of religious liberty? Look at the debates we have over appointees to the Supreme Court. These are all disagreements about justice and rights. Is there any difference between the fact of reasonable pluralism in the case of justice and rights and in the case of morality and religion? In principle, I don't think that there is. In both cases, what we do when we disagree is we engage with our interlocutor, as we've been doing here for an entire semester. We consider the arguments that are provoked by particular cases. We try to develop the reasons that lead us to go one way rather than another. And then we listen to the reasons of other people. And sometimes we're persuaded to revise our view. Other times we're challenged at least to shore up and strengthen our view. But this is how moral argument proceeds with justice, and so it seems to me also with questions of the good life. Now, there remains a further worry, and it's a liberal worry. What about if we're going to think of our disagreements about morality and religion as bound up with our disagreements about justice, how are we ever going to find our way to a society that accords respect to fellow citizens with whom we disagree? It depends, I think, on which conception of respect one accepts. On the liberal conception, to respect our fellow citizens' moral and religious convictions 
is, so to speak, to ignore them for political purposes, to rise above or abstract from or to set aside those moral and religious convictions, to leave them undisturbed, to carry on our political debate without reference to them. But that isn't the only way, or perhaps even the most plausible way, of understanding the mutual respect on which democratic life depends. There is a different conception of respect, according to which we respect our fellow citizens' moral and religious convictions, not by ignoring, but by engaging them, by attending to them, sometimes by challenging and contesting them, sometimes by listening and learning from them. Now, there's no guarantee that a politics of moral and religious attention and engagement will lead in any given case to agreement. There's no guarantee it will lead even to appreciation for the moral and religious convictions of others. It's always possible, after all, that learning more about a religious or a moral doctrine will lead us to like it less. But the respect of deliberation and engagement seems to me a more adequate, more suitable ideal for a pluralist society. And to the extent that our moral and religious disagreements reflect some ultimate plurality of human goods, a politics of moral engagement will better enable us, so it seems to me, to appreciate the distinctive goods our different lives express. When we first came together some 13 weeks ago, I spoke of the exhilaration of political philosophy and also of its dangers, about how philosophy works and has always worked by estranging us from the familiar, by unsettling our settled assumptions. And I tried to warn you that once the familiar turns strange, once we begin to reflect on our circumstance, it's never quite the same again. I hope you have by now experienced at least a little of this unease, because this is the tension that animates critical reflection and political improvement, and maybe even the moral life as well. And so our argument comes to an end in a sense, but in another sense goes on. Why, we asked at the outset, why do these arguments keep going even if they raise questions that are impossible ever finally to resolve? The reason is that we live some answer to these questions all the time. In our public life and in our personal lives, Philosophy is inescapable, even if it sometimes seems impossible. We began with the thought of Kant, that skepticism is a resting place for human reason, where it can reflect upon its dogmatic wanderings, but it is no dwelling place for permanent settlement. To allow ourselves simply to acquiesce in skepticism or in complacence, Kant wrote, can never suffice to overcome the restlessness of reason. The aim of this course has been to awaken the restlessness of reason and to see where it might lead. And if we have done at least that, and if the restlessness continues to afflict you in the days and years to come, then we together have achieved no small thing. Thank you. Thank you.